Now we will conduct the humorous speech contest. I don't know if anybody's used their phone to sell, uh, text, jump on Facebook, but now is the time to either silence it or even better yet, turn it off. Maybe mine will too. And what we'll do, we went through the speaking order earlier, but I will go through that once again. Our first speaker for the contest will be Jerry Evans, followed by Hugh Nikra. Third will be Linda Enigenberg. Fourth, Rudy Sedoyeva. Fifth, John Labe. And sixth, Dan Ekstrom. There will be one minute of silence between each speaker. And then after the sixth speaker, the judges will have all the time that they need. We ask silence during those times while the ballots are collected. And at this point, let's begin the humorous speech contest. Contest yeah. number one, Jerry Evans. Heads up! Heads up, Jerry Evans. Zombies. You see them everywhere, every day, in hotels and restaurants, on the street, on the subway, on the train, on planes. You see them in stores, you see them at malls, and even at airports. They have this blank look on their face, walking aimlessly, with their heads buried in their handheld assets. <laughs> Madam Toastmaster, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmaster. <laughs> Handhelds are different. They have shiny surfaces. They're sleek and satisfying to the touch. They give one a sense of empowerment. To hold it in one's grip is an exhilarating Macho experience, Ethel. <laughs> Even for women. Now I realize, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Toastmasters, that fads come and go. But every day I'm increasingly struck by the fact that I've never seen anything quite like the explosion of the handheld phenomenon. Even Pac-Man and Mario Brothers faded into the background of fun and games. I have difficulty picturing the day when handhelds will be replaced by the next big thing. <clears throat> We've all observed and experienced people tweeting and texting and putting on eye makeup down, <laughs> driving distractedly, all the distractions that we see every single day and we allow it to happen. Now as these fads come and go, there's one thing in particular that I find amazing about the handheld. And I haven't figured out exactly how it accomplishes this. It seems to level the playing field. It turns virtually everyone on the planet, Rose, from Wall Street wizards to minimum wage fast food workers, into geniuses. <laughs> Who knew? No matter what one's intelligence or station of life, he or she can find the nearest Chinese restaurant get the answers to any whimsical question, <coughs> or get the directions to just about anywhere within seconds. Other than government aid, Bob, what else could people possibly need to keep them contented, right? <laughs> <laughs> At the current pace of handheld technological advancement, it seems inevitable that these little digital somas will soon have a chokehold on every human brain. Did you know that there are more new handhelds activated every single day than new babies born, Linda? Can you believe that? <laughs> and studies have shown the average person checks his or her handheld, Greg, 150 times a day, or about once every six minutes. In the U.S., this is startling. Did you know that some people take the thing 
to the bathroom with them so they can sit and talk on the throne? I'm sorry. This is just wrong. But not for hygienic reasons, as you all suspect. No. If you're using your smartphone on the can, Lakin, you've just robbed yourself of the last vestige of refuge from interruption. You've tainted mankind's last fortress of solitude by dragging the equivalent of a computer into the equation. Can't you live five minutes without email, without texting, without tweeting, and Iqbal updating your Facebook status? <laughs> really? I mean, seriously, Iqbal. <laughs> So one can only help but wonder if these little digital somas, these little digital creatures, if they predestined that mankind would soon become a giant race of handheld zombies, so utterly mesmerized that they would lose interest in all the other mind-dulling activities that they had for decades. Is it possible, Glenn, that the fun addicts, that they'll eventually lose interest in college and pro sports? Reality television and rioting over imaginary grievances. <laughs> but here's even more startling statistics. Did you know that 65% or about two in three people they sleep with or next to their smartphones? In fact, both men and women have told me their spouses are cheating on them with Siri. <laughs> and 34% admitted to answering their cell phone during moments of intimacy. Now for some men, that might only be one to two minutes. <laughs> but hey, what happened to valuing the person you're with in person? There's even a resistance group that's formed against the rise of the machines. It's called C. R. A. P. Use your imagination for what it stands for. It's not what you think. It's citizens rising against phones. There are millions forming, joining the resistance around the world. So fellow humans, next time you have a close encounter with one of these handheld zombies, and they're wandering around aimlessly with this blank stare on their face, totally engrossed with their heads up, their handheld assets. <laughs> I want you to shock them, shake them, and wake them up, Ethel. And I want you to scream as loud as you can. Heads up. Heads up. <laughs> Say it again. Heads, Heads up. up. <clears throat> Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> Contestant number two, Piyush Nikra, being stupid. Being stupid, Piyush Nikra. Albert Einstein once said, Two things are infinite this grand universe and human stupidity. <laughs> he also said 
He is not quite sure about universe though. <laughs> Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Talking about human stupidity, I go to office every day and I see a grand phenomena unfolding in front of my eyes. That is about people holding doors for each other. I see three broad categories in it. The first is about the people who will hold the door wide open for you. These are the most loving, generous people on earth. They wouldn't even mind giving you a free hug. Now there is a second category of people who think this rule has been imposed on them by this cruel society. They would never want to hold the door, but they just don't want to sound rude. So what they do? We just go in first and we'll slightly hold the door for you. In their mind, they might as well be thinking, I'm not here holding this door for the rest of my life for you. You better hurry up. <laughs> There's a third category of people. These are the people who think they have descended from the royal family. <laughs> they consider it beneath their dignity to even open doors for themselves. <laughs> they are perfectly fine, people like you and me. They are not disabled. You know what they do? They push the button. <laughs> now, there, are, there is a subcategory. Mostly young men who switch from category 3 or 2 to category 1 when they see a beautiful woman <laughs> She might even be one mile away. <laughs> but they are very particular about timings. Who knows? Maybe in the coffee room, this poor lady will have to exchange <clears throat> complimentary smiles. Now, since we are discussing about young men and girls, let me give guys some advice. If a girl says, no, that's a yes. If she says, maybe, that's a no. If she says, we want, or we need, she wants. If she says, we need to talk. My dear friend, you better start running. Right away, right now, you are in big trouble. In a relationship, one party is usually right. The other party is the husband. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why your language, the language you speak, is called your mother tongue? Because your father never gets the chance to speak. <laughs> Coming back to my office, as I pass through the door, I greet the security guard sitting behind the front desk. Good morning. He says, good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. He says it with such a confidence. I think he would rather like to say, I can kill you, bury you right here, right now, and nobody will ever know. I just move on. And the first thing I do before I reach my office desk is I go to the restroom. Now in restroom, my, my dear friends, there are some basic etiquettes. If I'm minding my own business, and you are yours, please do not cross talk. How, do you really want to know how I am doing? How about I chop you into pieces, flush you down the toilet, and then I will say, I'm feeling great. <laughs> Talking about restrooms, I often see some guys who just go like this, and their hand rests on the wall, and then they do their business. My dear friends, this category of people, this guy, is the most tormented guy in your office. Please leave him alone. Don't go and do your business next to him. I always avoid it. This is his moment of silence, his moment of peace. Let him have it. He might not be, you know, feeling well in, at his home too. So, it's his place. Now, think about it for a moment, about human stupidity. Do you really like it? Do you really want it? Maybe not, but think about it in that way. If you see an average stupid guy, there are 50% people 
who are stupider than that guy. <laughs> I'm just talking maths, you know. <laughs> what you just saw today, right from the time I entered office till the time I almost reached my desk, was the trailer of my movie, Being Stupid with Piyush Nikra. <laughs> Paid for by friends of Northwest Division, District 30 Toastmasters. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Contestant number three, Linda Edigenberg. My big, fat, steamy adventure. My big, fat, steamy adventure, Linda Edigenberg. <laughs> I bought a house and I ended up with cement up my nose and down my backside. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, as we were walking up the steps to this home that I would eventually purchase, my realtor turned around and very nonchalantly said, it's just a little cosmetic work. And I thought, okay, I'd buy the house because he said, it's just a little cosmetic work. We walk in the door, I knew immediately what he was referring to. The entire house was full of wallpaper. Every room, every wall, horrible, ugly wallpaper. Bought the house anyway because he said it was just cosmetic work, and after all, what kind of loser <laughs> can handle a little bit of a wallpaper project? Not me. So I went down to my help a hardware man, and I said to the gentleman, I have an entire house full of wallpaper. I need to get rid of all of it. I need something cheap, easy, fast, and clean. I had to give the guy credit for self-control, because when I said that, he didn't even bust a smile. He said, ma'am, you can use chemicals, or you can use steam. And I said, which works best? He said, either works equally well. And I said, well, if they each work well on their own, then together the results will be spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought the whole kit and caboodle, brought it home, took everything out, put on my rubber gloves, put on my hat, put on my work duds, I scored the wallpaper, I sprayed the chemicals all over it, fired up the steamer, and the next thing you know, the wallpaper is beginning to bubble up, as anticipated. Perfect! Time for the steam. So I applied the steam to the wall. When I got to the end of that wall, I saw not only was the wallpaper bubbling, it was beginning to fall off the wall in big chunks, along with big globs of goo. Mm. So I hurry up and start scraping. 
And as I scraped, <laughs> the wallpaper would fall off the wall and run down my arm with big globs of goo. Oh. And every time I move my arm down, the goo would go down my glove yeah. and back up and back down. And before you knew it, I was up to elbows in disgusting, gooey glue. Now remember this whole time, the steamer's going full on. Oh. It's getting hot, sticky, <laughs> steamy, and I am beginning to sweat. There are rivers of sweat running down every orifice of my body. And when I felt this, <laughs> I involuntarily reached up and I away. And out the nose and in the ears and back down there. And yes, down the backside. Pretty soon, not only my elbows are covered in glue, I am covered in glue. It was going all right, and I was getting cranky, sweaty, sticky, irritated, ticked off. I decided it's time to open a window. Oh. Brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't long before I realized all this cool air rushing into the house. I realized that all this goo on my body was beginning to harden. Oh. So now I am not only anxious, ticked off, <laughs> agitated, irritated, sweaty, getting mad. To rub salt into the wound, now I am walking really funny. <laughs> and the harder I tried to rectify the situation, the worse it became. I felt I was starring in an episode of I Love Lucy. <laughs> it was at this point I completely lost it. I let loose with a river of profanity, <coughs> and I began to speak in tongues. <laughs> it was so profane that it would make the most hardened hell's angel weep like a little girl. <laughs> Threw down my hat and flipped out! Just said, blippity, 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 freaking flip wallpaper, and I just a little cosmetic! Wallpaper and pretty folks. <laughs> I did finish the project. And I managed to put the whole thing behind me. Even stayed on speaking terms with my realtor, who is to this day still known affectionately as the cosmetic guy. But I learned a few lessons from this adventure. I learned first that prior to embarking on any do-it-yourself home improvement project, Take your eight-year-old child next door to the neighbor's house before you exercise your right to free speech. <laughs> <laughs> My son is 22 years old now, and every profane word in his vocabulary, he learned from his mother. <laughs> I also learned that when you're house hunting, if your realtor turns around and very nonchalantly says, it's just a little cosmetic work, beat, beat, run and hide, you will end up with cement up your nose and down your backside in other places it should never be. <laughs> when I tell people a story, the result is typically the same. Wow, you must really hate wallpaper! To which I respond, here's how I feel about wallpaper. If you came up to me today and you said, Linda, would you rather dive headburst into a bathtub full of white hot needles and shove pencils into your eyeballs for all of eternity next to Satan himself, or would you rather strip wallpaper? My answer would be, what was that first option? <laughs> <laughs>
This time, contestant number four, Rudy Segovia. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys, Rudy Segovia. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. Boys will be boys. That's what my mother used to say every time my brother and I got into trouble. <laughs> but now my father, he believed in discipline. But don't be alarmed, back in the 1950s, parents used to spank their kids. I think it was the law back then. <laughs> <laughs> Not only could you spank your kids, but the neighbor could spank yeah. your kids. <laughs> <laughs> but, you spank your kids. <laughs> but with all that spanking going on, it didn't stop my brother and I from being mischievous. I'll tell you a few stories. When we were kids, we lived on a farm. Grandma used to babysit us. But one day, a field mouse comes in. Grandma grabs a broom, and she's trying to kill this mouse. The mouse ran into a closet. The closet didn't have a light. There was no inside knob. Grandma bravely gets to the doorway. Now, my brother and I are standing behind her. We looked at each other. And without saying a word, we knew what we were going to do. <laughs> he pushed her in and I pushed the door. <laughs> that was the funniest thing. Grandma's in there screaming and the mouse is running past her feet and she's screaming. You know, till this day, I don't understand how my parents didn't see the humor in that. <laughs> we got a good spanking that night. Something about a heart attack or old age. <laughs> but my father was very fair about the spanking. He used a system similar to Toastmasters. He would tell us what he was going to tell us. <laughs> and he would tell us. And before we spanked us, he would tell us what he told us. <laughs> Back in those days, there was a television show called The Rifleman. And it was a western, cowboys, and they were always having a draw, shooting each other. Well, we bought our father to buy us BB rifles. But he said, Okay, but I don't want you shooting at each other. Do not kill birds. Do not disturb property. Oh, we promised. We promised. My father comes home with the rifles. And now he tells us. I don't want you shooting at each other. There was something about an eye and black. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, don't kill birds. Don't disturb property. We go outside and we're shooting at the trees and at leaves and at cans. And, and we got bored, which is usually when we got in trouble. My brother says, do you want to have a draw? Yes. So we're standing about 10 feet away from each other, rifles at the side. He's going to do the countdown. One, two, three, draw. He begins. One. I started thinking, I am the rifleman. <laughs> two. He's a bad guy. Three. He must die. <laughs> Draw! Now my brother picks up the rifle and with his mouth he says, Bang! Me, I shot him. <laughs> and I hit him in the chest and he's, he's in pain. And I can see the red coming through the shirt as I broke the skin. And then I see anger. And when I saw that, I threw my gun and I ran. Now, he's running, chasing me, he's shooting at me, but he can't hit me because we're both moving. <coughs> I run into the house, he runs in behind me, and he's shooting at me inside the house. <laughs> my mother starts screaming, grandma starts screaming, my father comes out and... Stop. Now, my father got pretty good at this. He could undo his belt and pull it out with one hand. <laughs> but he would always roll up the belt, put it between us, and say, before I spank you, let me tell you what I told you. <laughs> <laughs> it always made it seem like it was our fault. <laughs> <laughs> this other time, we were outside and we were playing catch. And we're bored. <laughs> My brother says, do you want me to teach you how to drive? <laughs> yeah, I was 10 years old. He was going on 12. <laughs> he sneaks into the house, he gets the keys and a pillow, and I had to put a pillow under me so I could see over the dashboard. It's like the same problem I have today. <laughs> Start the car, and everything was fine. We're going down the road, gravel road. Now, I must have been looking at him 
looking for a radio station because if I had been looking at the road, I would have seen the curve in front of me. And I went down the embankment. Oh. Now I got both feet on the brake and I can't stop the car. We go down and we hit the bottom. We came out of the car and we ran, ran home. Guess what's the first thing that we did? We picked up our ball and we kept on playing. <laughs> My father comes out and he looks at an empty spot where his car's supposed to be at. And then he looks at us. Suspects. Now my brother's cool. He's stone face. He doesn't know anything. But when he looked at me, I started to cry. Robert made me do it! Robert made me do it! Where's the car? It's in the ditch over by the curb. Stay here. He goes to get the car and I'm crying. I know this one's going to hurt. <laughs> My father comes back with the car. It took him a while, but he got it out. It's all full of mud and grass and things under it. He says, get in the house. I started crying even harder. Oh, this is really going to hurt. He doesn't want the neighbors to hear. <laughs> and our closest neighbor is five miles away. <laughs> we walk in, sit at the sofa. Tell me what happened. I try to blame the car for going over the... And he starts to laugh. And he's laughing and laughing. I started crying even harder. Because I'm thinking, just like his car, he went over the edge. <laughs> he's going to kill us. Instead, my father said, boys, I want you to drive. It is not your time yet. Promise me that you won't take the car again. Oh, we promise, we promise. <laughs> he didn't spank us, he never spanked us again. He just turned to my mom and said, boys will be boys. This is <laughs>
about communication, about workload, and about power. Here's how I know from my own life as a clueless man. Exhibit A, 1970, college. Christine was perfect. Well, not as perfect as Karen. <laughs> but she was smart. She was pretty. She knew my name. <laughs> Me? Clueless. One Friday, a friend dialed Christine at her dorm and hands me the phone. Uh, oh, hey, hey, Chris, it's John. John Labby? <laughs> I was smooth. <laughs> oh, hey, John, how are you? Uh, good. Um, say, would you like to go see a movie tomorrow night? Oh, I'm sorry, John, I can't. I have plans tomorrow. But hey, I'm free tonight. Oh, okay, I understand. Well, I'll see you in class on Monday. Then. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe not quite so smooth. <laughs> Exhibit B, 1978 to present time. I do my share around the house. Groceries, two hours a week. Laundry, two hours a month. I clean the kitchen, two hours a year. <laughs> well, round it up. <laughs> Thing is, where we men really fall short is in making babies. Let's do the math, shall we? A pregnancy lasts 280 days, or 403,200 minutes. 403,200 minutes. In guy terms, that's enough time to watch the pregame, the game game, and the postgame for 560 Super Bowls. 560, It's a lot of beer and chicken wings. And how much time did we put into making that baby? Two hours? <laughs> Would you believe 30 minutes? Okay, all right, fess up. It was three minutes. Round it up. <laughs> Exhibit C, 1983. My wife Karen and I are making our first baby. A girl's name, no sweat. Boy's name, no deal. See, we wanted a name beginning with J. Family reasons. My family. I offered James. No, we're not naming our kid after your old roommate. Well, but it's better than all the other biblicals. Jeremiah, Job, Jehoshaphat. <laughs> she didn't like any of them. She says, no deal. And then she suggests, get this, Jason. Jason? I only know one Jason. He was a wimp. <laughs> No wimpy name for my son. I say, no deal. Right up to the morning, we had to go to the hospital. Guess who really, really was hoping for a girl? <laughs> Eight hours of grunting and sweating and pushing later. Well, on her part. <laughs> it's a boy. Oh boy. <laughs> Nurse hands him to Karen. Oh, she lights up. I mean, this is her baby that she just made all by herself. <laughs> hey, I put in my three minutes. <laughs> Maybe one to two. <laughs> the nurse turns to me and says, So, Dad. What's his name? His name? 403,200 minutes to negotiate. <laughs> no deal. I looked down at Karen. She's sweating, exhausted. But 
happier than I've seen her in, well, 400, 3,200 minutes. <laughs> His name? I'm sweating like a freshman asking out the prettiest girl on campus. <laughs> and then my inner CEO takes over. It's time for an executive decision. His name, I happen to notice Karen has a look on her face. I know that. <laughs> it says, you be careful, <laughs> Mr. Three Minutes. <laughs> His name, this young man's name is Jay Jason. Men, we may think we're in charge. She's the chairman of the board, Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> Final contestant, contestant number six, Dan Extra. The tale of my tale, or how I killed my mentor and my twin. The tale of my tale, or how I killed my mentor and my twin. Dan Extra. that knows that I needed directions. Everybody knows men are never supposed to ask for directions. I'm melting in front of you. Oh my God, how horrible. Why do men think that they should never ask for directions? It's pure arrogance. Why? Because they think that they were born, no, before they were even conceived, they were born with a little compass on their pointy little wiggly cell, Y cell heads. So they always know where they're supposed to be going. I didn't get that <clears throat> compass. I don't know what happened. Or maybe I got it and I lost it. I don't know. But I have never had it. So I've spent my life being lost so many times that it frightens me. And I've all, but it, but it has led to some adventures where I found and learned things that maybe I never would have learned if I hadn't been lost. So one of the things that happens when you're lost is you feel compelled to ask people for help sometimes. Sometimes I learn this from this person, and I learn that from that person. But in the, in the end, I have to kind of make up my own mind because I'm not necessarily trusting all the sources of information that I get. So it's a matter of trial and error. You learn from here, you learn from here, you try your own. Sometimes you succeed, and sometimes you don't. 
I believe that it was Thomas Edison who said, you can't have success with a lot, without a lot of failures. Well, I'm here to tell you that given all my failures, I have a lot of success waiting for me. The only question is whether I'll live long enough to get it. <laughs> the first time that I was ever really lost, some of you heard it last year, I actually got lost in my own work. That's true. <clears throat> Nobody told me how to be born. Nobody told me what I was supposed to do. So I got lost and I got turned around. And it took a long time for me to find out where I was supposed to go. I could have used some help. There was no one to ask for directions. So I got stuck. And I came out this way first, but everybody else was supposed to come out this way first. It didn't happen for me. But since that time, I've decided to make the best of a bad situation. I started working on some ideas. I've got some inventions going. For example, it seems to me I could have used a nice exit sign right here. This is where you leave. Sounds good to me, no brainer, right? Or how about maybe some runway lights like they have at the airport? <laughs> just a string of them, just come right down out. Here you go. Good idea, right? Or maybe a little slide they can put in and just <laughs> be born. Easy enough. <coughs> or perhaps somebody could invent a little GPS that you put in there with the baby, and if the baby's going in the wrong direction, you give it a little shot. Pretty soon they'll figure it out. I would have it. And if you're going the wrong way, big time, a big shot. I would take that over the humiliation that I felt from my own birth. So, last idea, how about this? How about a little cell phone with a little MapQuest or a little Siri on it? And it says, and the, and the child can say, Directions, please, Siri. Where do you like to go? Where would you like to go? To the outbound exit, please. Get a, gathering data. Here you give me your give me your location. Boom. Easy as pie. New way to fix a difficult problem, at least it was for me. So life is a learning process. But this took me back even further, I realized I had been lost even before my own birth. Matter of fact, I was lost for my own conception. So there I was, swimming. I didn't have arms, and I was just <laughs> swimming and swimming. But I didn't know where to go. And I saw millions of other people around that looked just like me. Well, they really weren't people. They were just things like me. And we're all going like this. But I was lost. I'm like, where are they all going? So I look, and I talk to one guy, and I say, hey, I'm lost. Where am I supposed to go? Get lost. Get more lost, he says. Wow, these guys are mean. I go to another guy. I said, hey, where am I supposed to go? He goes, get lost. I said, why is everybody so mean? It's survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest? I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. OK, so tell me this. Where are we going? To the egg, man, to the egg. What's an egg? It's where we go. What do we, it's what we do. OK, well, can I follow you? He goes, yeah, I follow you. So we're going, and we're swimming along. And I say to him, OK, what do we do when we get there? He says, when we get there, we break the egg. Why do we do that? So you can climb in. Climb in? Why would I want to do that? Because that's how you make a baby. Oh. I still don't know what a baby is. <laughs> I decided I'd better not ask any more questions. So lo and behold, we're swimming away and swimming away. We pick a clean path right down the middle between everybody else. We get there at the very same time. And I'm thinking, wow. And then I say to him, hey, you know what? I got a couple more questions. How many of us actually get to go into the egg? He says, one or two or three. I said, well, what happens to everybody else? If they didn't get to the egg, they die. Oh, that's scary. So let's go in together, I say. We'll be twins. He goes, great. So we go to high five. Now we don't have arms. So we smack our tails together. I've never gotten over the guilt that I feel, even now, because I didn't know my own strength. And I actually I accidentally knocked him off that egg. And he went down and down and down. Oh my god. I killed my own twin. He mentored me on how to get here. And I killed him. 
I'm going to make an app for that. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, the ballots have all been collected. While we're waiting for those to be tabulated, I would like at this time to have the evaluation contestants come forward. <laughs> Around, Toast Spencer's for body. 
what earn, what have you earned? How far have you gone into the program? I have an ACG, an ALB, and I have an HPL away from my DTM. Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping to do an event in January, which will take care of that detail. Excellent. One question. I'm here to have your favorite quote. Life isn't about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. What is it about that quote that speaks to you? As most people who know me know that I'm a master gardener. I love everything that grows. I love that you get to notice a change and a bud today is going to be a flower tomorrow. And I think that's true of our goals also. You know, the awkward things you start with, the more you practice them, the more you can demonstrate and grow. And growth is the exciting part. Thank you very much. I'd like to present you with a contest certificate. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Share with us what you've earned in your Toastmasters career. Um, I just completed my second DTM. Wow. I've been a member for 19 years. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. What inspires you the most? My grandchildren. Oh. My, uh, my daughter has two boys, 15 and 12, and then my son. Just married when he was 40, and he's got now a four year old, a two year old, and a eight month old. And I just love going over to babysit. I used to have to beg my daughter and give her money to go out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I could hear the voice in my son's and daughter in law's voice. I said, I'll just be over. <laughs> They're stressed out. But I just love uh, playing with them and really observing. I can actually hear the emotion in your voice yeah. and how, how much they mean to you. Thank you for participating. And here's a bit of a Please share with us what you've earned since you joined Postmasters. I've earned my advanced communicator silver and my advanced leader bronze. All right. My favorite quote down here says, don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in his footsteps. Mm -hmm. What is it about that <coughs> quote that speaks to you? Well, actually, that quote was given to me by my dad. And my dad was uh, recently passed away. But he actually was one hell of a guy. He was um, he's a very good guy, and uh, he taught me that, cause I guess I quick to judge. And uh, you know, I guess I, one, at one particular time, I got on him about mom and him breaking up. And he's like, hey, son, just don't judge until you walk a mile in my footsteps. And that stuck with me. That stuck. He told me that a long time ago. But it stuck with me. And I try not to do that, even today. Thank, Thank you very much. challenges in life, when they present themselves, if you don't overcome it the first time, never, never give up. I read this in Churchill's book when I was young, and it stuck with me forever. So I've been married three times. Last time was 35 years. Thank you. So at this time, will the other four humorous speakers please come forward? Looking 
end here. Notable, yes. notable accomplishments. Toastmaster of the Year twice. Wow. Yes. yes. How did you win that? I paid the judges. <laughs> 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 That's what I okay, kept it fair. Yes. Now, a couple of years ago, you did something that, when I heard you were going to do it, terrified me. Can you explain to the crowd what you did with your son? Oh, okay. <laughs> about three years ago, he and I took a trip to Ecuador. And the way it came about it, he would always call me and say, you know, Jerry, would you like to do, you know, something crazy and kind of wild, like go to Toastmasters? Mm -hmm. But then he called me and he said, well, why don't we go to Ecuador? And I'm like, okay, what are we going to do in Ecuador? He says, well, we can go down the Amazon River, we can climb some mountains, we can do a bunch of other things. So we booked a trip to Ecuador, and so we did those things. And one of the most amazing experiences was that we got to go down the Amazon, go through the Amazon rainforest. And so he and I spent 10 days doing that, plus climbing some mountains, hiking some mountains, and that was absolutely incredible. And it was a great bonding time with my son. Oh, wow. Great. That's Thank cool. you. son. He's 22 and he keeps his room a complete pigsty. It's worse than you can possibly imagine. But he's 22. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't run around. He is honest almost to a fault. So I figure if you can get him to 22 and he's a hard worker. He works hard and he's respectful. He helps around the house. If you can get all that, leave the room alone. So I'm most proud of this incredible young man. Who was also a Toastmaster for some time, too. Oh. <laughs> John 
is uh, DTM. Yes, yeah. 736 days ago. Let me tell you that. Yeah. number guy, I want to, I know something about you. I want to ask you, you're an author. Correct. Why don't you share with us a little bit about what the book is about and what drove you to write that? Mostly, uh, the book I wrote called Random Wisdom Connections is a series of reflections based on quotes. Reflections on the act of speaking, teaching, and training, because ultimately they're really all the same task. Just get your audiences differently and have slightly different purposes. So it's really a very personal book, a series of reflections, all very short. I actually ran into somebody at a recent contest who blew me away. He said he'd actually read it twice. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll get the spelling better next time. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. In your post-dance career, what have you worked? I have a uh, dance communicator, Silver, and a dance leader, Brown. I know tomorrow is the Chicago Marathon. There'll be over 8,000 people competing. In fact, one of the area directors in the Northwest Division it will be running in that tomorrow. Have you ever run a marathon? I've done three, actually. I did my first one when I was 50. And if anybody had told me that I would ever do a marathon, I would have, no, never. I used to look in the newspaper and see that route, and I thought, there is no way. But I got into my middle 40s and realized I needed to do a few things to prolong my life, actually. And so I just started walking and then running and running and walking, and pretty soon I could run a little farther and walk a little less. And one of my neighbors said, you know, you can do a marathon. I said, no, I can't. No, I can't. And then I did. And then I did it again. I did it one more time, and if I had the time to train, I would do it again if I could. It's an amazing, uh, just thinking about it, when the very beginning, if you get up in the morning and you watch it on TV, when there's that mass of humanity stretching back several blocks uh, before the, the starting line, I was way in the back, of course, otherwise I wouldn't want it. <laughs> but you get, a, you get an, an adrenaline rush, you get a little excitement, you get a tingle, and and then the, the, the horn goes off, you can't really hear it back where we are, but everybody starts walking, and a little faster, and a little faster, and pretty soon you're starting to run, and then you hit the starting line, and you still think, I'm gonna win. <laughs> it's just the coolest feeling in the whole world. It, it just is, it just is, so go for it. <laughs> Thumbs up that we are ready. And at this time, I'd like to call up Rose. Rose. Who has the results. <laughs> Before she announces that, German, please join us as well. Let's give a round of applause to all the contestants. Maria, also for being our target speaker. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Awesome job, and I just want to give you a little something for being the Toastmaster. Thank you. Nice job. Um, I would like actually to call up the district trio to help present the awards.
It's my honor to announce, oh, I know. Have a drum roll for the third place evaluation. And that goes to Mr. Jerry Evans. Second place, evaluation. And that goes to Mr. Greg Thompson. Come on down.
Okay, Frank, you want to say your last words and we shall be listening. Bye. You know, <laughs> it's been awesome, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're done here, right? What do you think about this contest? Good job. Yeah. Clear this contest adjourned. Thank All you, Greg right. Paper. Contestants. Rudy, can I see you? Come on up for yes. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you.